So it's my very great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of two of our volunteers from the Egypt Centre today. The first speaker will be Molly Beck, who is going to give a talk, Witch Snatched, unveiling the process behind wig making and the wig industry in ancient Egypt. Molly is a master's student from Colorado, USA. She graduated from Sonza University with a BA in Egyptology and is currently enrolled in the Ancient Egyptian Culture Master's Programme at Swansea. The topic for her undergrad dissertation was wig making and the wig industry, and she is currently researching beekeeping in ancient Egypt for her master's dissertation. We'll have to invite you back for another talk, Molly. Oh, <laughs> She's also worked in Egypt on the archaeological team with the South Africa Sea Conservation Project and hopes to return again this season. So thank you so much for speaking for us, Molly. We really, really appreciate it. Yeah. And we're ready when you are. Thank you so much, Sam. What a lovely introduction. And thank you all so much for uh, coming today to our Friends of the Egypt Center lecture. Um, I hope you enjoy both of the talks today. So with that, here is Wig Snatched unveiling the process behind wig making in the wig industry in ancient Egypt. Oh, it's gonna do that. Hold on, I gotta stop sharing and then share. Yeah, if you just log back in. So I would ask that people turn off their mics whilst Molly is speaking. If you have any questions for Molly, do pop them into the chat and Ken and I will collect them up to ask Molly at the end of her lecture. Awesome. Uh, so just a little overview. Uh, this lecture is focused on how wigs were made through Pharaonic Egypt and their industrial and economic impact on ancient Egyptian society. With that being said, I want to start off by um, going over what is a wig in the ancient context, uh, some wig making techniques, the evolution of wig making throughout uh, Pharaonic Egypt, and ending with some evidence of wig making as an industry. Um, so the first section is focused on what Egyptian wigs looked like in depictions and in real life and why they might have been worn. Um, so the context and purpose of wigs, uh, of wig use in ancient Egypt is highly debated. Uh, some scholars suggest that um, it could have been a display of status or um, social rank. Um, others suggest that it was worn only during special occasions um, like festivals or ceremonies. Uh, and some suggest that it was for personal enjoyment or uh, to protect the natural hair. Um, it is also debated what was done with the natural hair while wearing a wig. Uh, some suggest it was saved, uh, others suggest um, the natural hair was kept long, um, oh, no. but so, so this so could have varied from uh, period to period and um, also could have been a personal choice. But overall, it seems that uh, men might have shaved their head completely uh, while women uh, might have kept their natural hair long and worn their wig right on top of it. Uh, most surviving examples of wigs uh, are shown, um, have been excavated from tombs and temples. Uh, it's also very common to find uh, the wig actually on the body um, of the deceased. And both elite members and gods have been shown wearing wigs and depictions of wigs are found in all different uh, art mediums, which we will look at next. But overall, the construction process um, of ancient wigs is very similar to some modern practices. Um, here are a few examples of wig depictions uh, that we see in Egyptian art. These mediums cover uh, stone, wood, uh, tile and pottery, uh, papyrus, linen, precious stones and metal, and gems and many more. Um, these examples spread over uh, many periods of history and wigs can be seen um, in art from uh, or the early Old Kingdom and all the way down through the late period. Here are some actual examples of what wigs looked like. Um, all of the wigs you see here are made of human hair and um, these are three different styles. Uh, so these uh, three photos on the right here, I hope you can see my cursor. Um, these are the same wig, uh, photos of the same wig, different angles, and this was typically worn by men. 
And over here in the bottom left corner, uh, this wig was worn by women and this top wig um, here was also worn by women. So now we're going to look at the different construction techniques used throughout Pharaonic Egypt. Uh, and we'll also look at some popular wig styles and examples. Um, the most common uh, raw materials used in wig construction were uh, human hair. And in the later periods, uh, plant fiber from the date palm tree was used both in the construction of the body of the wig and used as stuffing. Uh, this stuffing was used to add shape and volume to the wig uh, without adding uh, more hair and raw materials. So stuffing wigs was an efficient way to save material by achieving the same look. Uh, and it likely made wigs a lot lighter in weight and more comfortable to wear on the head. Um, and uh, next, a bees, uh, mixture of beeswax and resin uh, was used to hold the braids, curls, and general style of the wig. So essentially, it was ancient hairspray. Uh, styling tools such as owls, picks, combs, and pins were used to section, style, and hold the hair during the construction process. Uh, different wig styles incorporated different construction techniques. Uh, in order to achieve the desired look. And we'll be looking at that in the next slide. And uh, during the late period, the use of techniques involving uh, fib plant fibers, reeds, linens um, became more popular. And you have some uh, wig pins in these pictures just to the right. Uh, the first step of the construction process was gathering the hair and processing it. This included uh, cleaning, uh, combing, and detangling the hair before it was uh, used in the uh, foundation of the wig. And after the hair was prepped, then they would make the desired wig foundation. Uh, the second step was attaching uh, small sections of hair to the foundation in the desired style. These sections could be braided or curled, and some wig styles incorporated both uh, braids and curls, which we will see. Uh, the third step um, was used for finishing touches and overall styling of the hair. And this is likely where the stuffing would have been added, uh, depending on the style. And the final step is where the uh, beeswax and resin, resin mixture would have been applied to hold the styling of the hair. Uh, all right, here's some more technical uh, information. Uh, <laughs> there are two common wig foundations. The first is a net base um, of braided strands of hair uh, or string in a rhomboidal or diamond pattern. And you can see an example of this in the top two photos. The left photo has a more blown out version and the right photo has um, a close up where you can really see that diamond shape and you might have to minimize the pictures on the side to see it. But um, essentially this created a mesh that individual strands of hair could be attached to. Um, the second foundation was uh, the use of one large thick braid that would run down the head from forehead to neck that uh, smaller hair sections would be attached to. And uh, you can see that in this bottom photo, uh, right in the center of that wig where my cursor is, is the larger braid that all of these little hair sections are attached to. And when it comes to attaching the hair, I have this lovely diagram right here, and it's a little tricky to explain, so just bear with me. But um, a section of hair would have been soaked in the wax mixture, and um, after that, it would be looped around the foundation and pressed back against itself. And since that mixture was kind of sticky, it would hold it um, while they uh, took a smaller strand of that section and wrapped it around itself 
Um, so once that mixture had set and hardened, it would be really secure on the foundation. So you would not be losing any hair out of this wig. <laughs> um, uh, both the braids and curls were used in the styling of wigs, depending on the desired style. Um, braids and curls could vary in size and shape, so you could really customize your look. Um, and curls were obtained by uh, soaking the strand of hair in the wax mixture and then wrapping it around a dowel and until the mixture hardened. And once it had set, the dowel could be removed and you were left with a lovely curl. So essentially ancient hairspray, which is really cool. There we go. All right, uh, now we're going to look at some uh, popular styles and examples of wigs. So uh, one of the most common is the duplex or double style. Um, and it gets its name from its very unique appearance uh, with two uh, very distinct uh, sections. And this uh, wig style uses the net base foundation. And um, as there are a lot more individual strands of hair used in this wig, it needed um, a foundation that was more structurally sound. So that's why it uses the net base. And um, it features small, tight ringlets on the top section, which you can see in this left photo. And the bottom section has very long, thin braids. And this photo just below it is a nice close-up. Um, and what's really cool about this style of wig is that you could really um, alter each section and uh, change it to look the way you wanted it to. So if you look at the two photos on the right, um, you can see that the curled and um, braided sections are much more dramatic and much larger than this example on the left. Uh, this style was worn by elite men and has mostly been found in tombs. And most of the ex surviving examples date to the middle of uh, the 18th dynasty, so the New Kingdom, and to the Third Intermediate Period. Um, next up is the gala wig, or also known as the enveloping wig, which was worn by elite women. Um, this style was constructed using the long center braid technique. And you can almost see it in this photo on the left. It would run all the way down the head here. But um, this style features long strands of hair that were curled using the um, wax mixture technique. And this style could also um, use braided instead of curled sections. So once again, you could really kind of customize these um, depending on the time period and personal choice. Uh, most examples of these are found in tombs, either near or on the body, and most have actually uh, been found uh, worn by the deceased during the mummification process, so they are inside of the wrappings. And most of the surviving examples date to the 18th dynasty, and the third intermediate period. Uh, up next, we have the short round and curly wig, which was also worn by elite women. Um, these wigs were constructed using the net base with individual strands attached. Um, the size and shape of the curls could um, vary depending on the desired look. So if you look at the photo on the right, you can see that these curls are much larger and looser compared to um, the two examples on the left and uh, where their curls are much tighter and smaller. Um, this was a popular style for women throughout uh, Egyptian history um, with examples dating from the Middle Kingdom to the Roman period. Um, and just a fun fact, the oldest wig in the Cairo Museum is a short round curly wig that dates to the 11th dynasty. And of course, I have not been able to find a photo of this, but I am sure it looks very similar to these three examples here. 
oh shoot, sorry. Um, some other common styles um, include the tripartite wig and the bob wig. Um, the tripartite wig is one of the most common uh, wigs used in art depictions and ironically is um, the wig with the least surviving examples. So that is of course just the way it goes, um, but the two, um, the only two examples I've seen uh, both date to the third intermediate period and are in the Cairo Museum. And I've not seen a picture of these, uh, but they are as described as being made with hundreds of long braids tied on three sections of a square foundation of black linen string. Uh, the ends of each braid set with pellets of beeswax and resin. So um, this wig featured a center parting with short face framing side braids and longer braids in the back. So that really gives it that um, unique uh, three section look, hence the tripartite name. Uh, next is the bob wig. And um, the bob wig is described as being wide braids fanning out from the central part with shorter braids near the front, longer braids in the back, creating a gradual and framing effect. This uh, specific example on the right here uh, belonged to Princess Nanny dating to the um, 21st dynasty and its foundation is made from a central braid woven into a linen cap. So it's actually a mix of both the net base um, foundation style and the center braid. So it's a good mix. Um, all right, next um, we're moving on to the section of evolution and wig making. Uh, here I want to touch on the evolution of examples and depictions of wigs throughout Pharaonic Egypt and highlight when the wig uh, making and wig wearing process became popular. Uh, it is most likely the case that wig making uh, started on a much smaller scale rather than going from wearing no wigs at all to having fully developed styles and techniques. And luckily there is some uh, evidence for the beginning stages. Um, the first use of false hair we see is uh, dates to the pre-dynastic period around 3500 BC during the Nakata II phase. And both of these examples come from Cemetery HK43 and Hyacanthus, which is uh, right here just south of modern day Luxor. Um, and the first comes from burial 16 of a um, woman who had small sections of matted hair knotted to her natural hair. And this is what we would roughly describe as being hair extensions, um, as they uh, most likely gave the appearance of thicker and fuller hair. And you can see um, a picture of this in the top right here. Um, but it, it is assumed um, that these sections were knotted um, to the root of her natural hair. So it really blended in with her natural hair. Uh, next is burial 333, belonging to a man who had um, a hair piece made of animal hide and hair. And I believe this is the oldest toupee and you can see it uh, just in the bottom corner here. And um, it's assumed that uh, this would have been glued or somehow stuck to the owner's head and possibly worn uh, during daily life or maybe on special occasions. Unfortunately, not much is known about these two, but they do show that hair in its appearance held uh, some sort of importance during the early stages of Egyptian history. And uh, finally, um, some work sections of hair were found at Abydos, uh, just north of modern day Luxor, right here on the map. And um, this is just a bundle of um, small braided sections of hair. 
uh, depictions of wigs um, are present from as early as the first dynasty and continue all the way until the very late periods of Egyptian history. These depictions are also present in many different art forms, which we looked at earlier, and um, you can see some stone examples to the right here. The actual use and wearing of wigs seems to have been introduced after the fourth dynasty, but this is a rough guess. Um, unfortunately, there are no surviving examples uh, from the old kingdom. And um, so it's really hard to pinpoint exactly when the actual wearing and use of wigs began. Uh, it can be noted that different styles of wigs were highlighted and differentiated in early old kingdom art. Um, for example, uh, men and women are shown wearing different wig styles. And uh, both elite members and gods were shown wearing wigs, which um, kind of suggests an early religious association with wigs um, or some kind of religious influence. Uh, the intermediate periods can get a little weird with uh, trying to find archaeological material in general. Um, however, one of the oldest wigs recovered is from an 8th dynasty tomb at El Hagarsha. But in, in general, very few archaeological examples and materials are found from the first two intermediate periods, but depictions of wigs um, are still common and seen in the art from this period. You can see some examples on the right here. Uh, based on archaeological evidence, wigs quickly gained popularity during the 11th dynasty. And as mentioned earlier, the oldest wig in Cairo uh, dates to the 11th dynasty as well. Uh, a very important discovery of ancient wig making is the wig workshop excavated in 1974 near the mortuary temple of Montuhotep II at Dar al Bahri. And I will be coming back to this workshop. Um, we also uh, begin to see hairdressing scenes during this period. Um, which you can see examples of on the right here. And this is a close-up of this. And uh, these two are just very large um, braided sections of hair. Uh, the New Kingdom is where we start to see actual wigs and more variety of wig styles in depictions. The most common styles uh, being the male duplex wig and the female gala wig um, that we looked at earlier. Uh, we also see a development in specific titles relating to wig making and the cult of the moon at Karnak. And I will also be coming back to this title a little later. Um, and as mentioned, the uh, second intermediate period does not have any archeological evidence but depictions of wigs are still common during this period and well into the New Kingdom. And the New Kingdom does see a wider variety of wigs um, in depictions and in archeological examples. Uh, most of these surviving examples date to the 20th and 21st dynasties. From this, it seems that uh, the wear and use of wigs was very popular in the early Third Intermediate Period and well into the late period. The Third Intermediate Period saw an increase in the use of plant fiber in wigs, both as the main body of the wig and as stuffing. And we also see more examples of wigs with net bases made of linen or string rather than hair as seen in earlier periods. Um, there is also an increase in diversity of wig styles in this period. So it seems from the Old Kingdom down to the mid-late period, there was a gradual increase in wig depiction and in archaeological examples. But after the mid-late period, there seems to be a kind of drastic decrease in um, wig depictions and we really just stop seeing um, examples of wigs as well. So it kind of had a large buildup and then a short cutoff. Um, the final section 
is going uh, to cover the evidence of the wig industry. One of the most important discoveries of the wig industry is the wig workshop found near the Mor uh, Mortuary Temple of Montuhotep II at Darum Bahri. The excavation was led by the Polish Center of Mediterranean Archaeology in Cairo. And during their 1974 season, they were surveying just above the temple. And in this top picture, it was right around here. And in the bottom picture, right over here on the left, just up against the rock there. Um, and uh, in this area, they found two round mud brick constructions on an embankment of stones and mud brick. Um, and among this, uh, they found many wig making materials, including a wig net base, hair extensions and braided sections, a model head, uh, wig and hair styling tools, and much more. The, ex the existence of this workshop being so close to the temple is quite interesting. It shows that um, religion played some kind of role in the wig industry, and it is possible that priests and the temple staff were the um, main consumers and uh, wearers of wigs, um, thus explaining why the workshop might have been located so close to the temple. Um, and uh, it can also suggest that wigs were popular in this area of Thebes and um, other factors such as archaeological material and evidence and general use of wigs drastically increased uh, during the 11th dynasty. Uh, therefore, this workshop is contemporary with this increase in evidence. Um, and here are some photos from this excavation. So this top left photo is um, a wig net base and you can just see the rhomboidal or diamond pattern right at the top here. This bottom photo is a section of worked hair in uh, braids and you can see the little pellet of the wax mixture on the end. Uh, these Two photos in the middle are bundles of braided hair sections. And this photo on the right is of an owl, which was used for styling and sectioning the wig. This is by far the most intriguing uh, find from this uh, excavation. This is the model head. It was used for constructing the uh, wig foundation and the wig itself. Um, this uh, gave the wig maker a form to work off of. And if you look super, super closely, sorry for the qualities of these pictures, but if you look on the right at the very top of the head here, and in these two photos in the middle, just on the top of the form, you can just make out faint um, outlines of the um, rhomboidal or diamond pattern that was used to uh, make the foundation. So in other words, this helped the wig maker have a precise found like outline that he could follow to make a uh, foundation, a wig foundation. And you can also see in this far right picture, the um, outline of the hairline and it kind of starts over here on the forehead and goes down the side and over the ear and all the way to the back of the neck. And over on this left photo, you can see a cross which marks the middle of the face. And uh, these outlines uh, were to help the wig maker see where exactly to stop the wig base so that it would not cover or obstruct the brow, eyes, or face. And here is a um, just a comparison of that um, outline of the hairline. And this is a uh, Ptah statue from Tutankhamun's tomb, but I included it here just so you could see that um, outline really well. But yeah. 
an important factor of analyzing the wig industry is to take its economic scale into consideration. And one can do this by seeing what other areas of Egyptian society were affected by and reflected the wig industry. For example, other craft or specialized areas that were impacted by the wig industry include jewelry making, carpentry, farmers and cultivators, and beeswax and resin suppliers. Uh, these areas all created um, its own products that played a role in um, the wig industry and in wig making. And uh, to the right, uh, these are all uh, wig adornments. So this top row is a um, wig headdress. It would have been worn right over the wig as you see um, in these photos. And this uh, middle photo on the bottom is of um, wig tubes, uh, little golden tubes that were worn around individual strands of hair and they could vary in size and shape as well. And um, here's some more examples. Uh, this is a wig box on the left that this wig was found in, so used for storage. And um, this photo on the top right is the gold uh, top piece of a headdress. And this photo on the bottom is a close-up of those golden tubes. And uh, finally, just briefly, I want to highlight some of the aspects of religion in the wig industry. Uh, so uh, specific wigs uh, could be associated with specific gods. For example, you have the Hathor wig, which is seen uh, just in the bottom photo here. And um, also the tripartite wig, which is shown in the top photo. Um, also, the 11th Dynasty Wig Workshop shows a close relation with the temple staff and wigs and wig consumption. Uh, and next, the um, I wanted to look at the title, which is in, pictured in this slide. Uh, here's the transliteration on the left and the translation in the middle. And it isn't until the New Kingdom that we see a specific title relating to a wig maker. And um, this could suggest that um, during this period, um, a distinction between hairdresser and wig maker was finally made, or it could possibly just be a reflection of the lack of archeological material and what has survived today. Um, but the overall um, role of religion in wig making is present, but it's kind of blurred. We're not quite sure how big of a role it played, um, but it's just one of those things we can't be sure of until we find the missing pieces of the puzzle. Um, and just to wrap up, some conclusions are that hair and its appearance was important to the Egyptians as early as the pre-dynastic period. Uh, wig wearing had practical, social, religious, and economic factors. Wig making was a specialized craft that took time and skill. And there is some correlation between hairdressing and wig styling. Um, we are uncertain if they were considered the same thing or if they were um, completely different. Uh, but there is some connection. Uh, and the wig workshop shows a development in the process of wig making, making it more efficient and faster, thus increasing wig production and wig consumption. And um, the increased use of plant fibers in the late period suggests that wigs had become extremely popular and demand of them increased. Um, and they were possibly then available to the lower class members. But yeah, that is me done. Thank you all so much for your time and attention, and I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much, Molly. That was absolutely amazing. That was such a comprehensive run through. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Sam.
it's something I've never really thought about the construction of wigs. Obviously, you find them in these archaeological contexts and you see them represented in statues, but it's not really something I ever thought yeah. about. So thank you for enlightening us. That was absolutely yeah, fantastic. Of course. Thank you so much. So I've got a couple of questions for you now that we'll ask oh, and then cool. we'll let Catherine share her slides as well. So the first question oh. is from Bob. Have you ever mm -hmm. tried out similar wigs yourself to see what they're like and how are they worn? And do you have any idea how they would have coped with the hot temperatures wearing these wigs? <laughs> I have not. Um, I think I've probably worn like, you know, a cheap party, you know, Halloween <laughs> wig, but nothing. Um, super serious or like very fancy um and let's see uh that is a really interesting point um it's interesting that some scholars have suggested that they would have worn them to uh combat the heat but it oh. from what i can tell it looks like there was a lot of hair <laughs> on those wigs so they were probably incredibly hot and I do know that some wigs were actually perfumed to help mask the smell that I'm sure everyone <laughs> experienced. But yeah, I haven't, uh, that's really all that I've seen, but it's definitely interesting to think that they, you know, would wear that in the lovely Egyptian sun. <laughs> I suppose if you think about current fashions though, we often wear things that aren't the most comfortable or practical yes. climates we're in. I've been down Wine Street in Sydney a couple of times. <laughs> Yes, that is very true. <laughs> the next question is from Robin, who mentions during the reign of Amenhotep III, there was a period of big hair, the all enveloping style. Yes. Um, would they use something like a palm fiber base to lighten the weight? How would they cope with sheer weight of something like that? Yeah, that is something that um, I've wondered myself looking at all of these and um, you can definitely see the uh, increase in size over uh, time. A lot of the wigs from the Middle Kingdom are quite small compared to some of the late period examples. And um, I do think that the fiber would have made it a little lighter because um, they probably just did like some construction just on the top and then kind of rammed a bunch of fiber in the middle and then it's there's it's so hard to look at fiber because these wigs are so brittle now and they're really delicate so you can't really like you know move them around and get on the inside of them but yeah I do think there's some kind of use for them in there. <laughs> I'll ask you one more question now if that's okay. okay. Are you okay to hang around yeah. again for some more? Of course yes. Fantastic. The last one I'll ask about is the model heads. Did you mention what they were made of? And is it possible yes. that they might be an ancestor first? They could be linked to two. They look very similar. The, um, yes, the uh, model head was made of, um, it was wood, so it was a wooden sculpture. And um, it, I'm not quite sure um, the like full intended context of the head I it seems more so that it was just used for like a learning and teaching model rather than uh, like an ancestor bus that would have been in a tomb or something like that it's probably more along the lines of a art learning bus kind of like the bus of Nefertiti yeah. or other art examples I'm like here's how you do it and here's what it should look like type thing it's a really interesting object yeah, it's, it was so crazy to look at it. Um, I just love the little model head. So I like cute. the little lines where you can see where they've tried to figure it out. Yeah. Absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I'll have so to have a proper cool. look at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so thank you so, so much, Molly. If you don't mind, we'll come back yeah. to you at the end. I'm very conscious of time. We have got some more questions. I have been noting them all down for you. Okay, that is but awesome. Thank you so much. That was absolutely amazing. It's so thank brilliant having a chance to let our the university students and EC volunteers have a chance to talk about their research. <laughs> yes, thank you so much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was so fun. We'll let you grab yourself a drink before we harangue you with any more questions. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you. Kath, if you're there, my lovely, would you mind sharing your screen for us, please? No problem. I'll just do that one now. 
there we are. Thank you. Can yeah. you guys see that? Yep, you can see that. You haven't got it on full screen yet. There we go. Perfect. There we are. Sorted. So thank you so much for joining us, Kath. Yet again, another Egypt Centre volunteer alumni. We always have the best ones. <laughs> So Catherine has gained both a BA Egyptology and Classical Civilizations, as well as an MA in Ancient Egyptian Culture from Swansea University. Whilst undertaking these courses, she volunteered with excavations such as the South Apathy Conservation Project and museum work, including at the Egypt Centre. More recently, she's worked on the Cirque Art Project at the British Museum. She aims to embark on a PhD programme in September analyzing the functionality of incense in ancient Egypt, which would be really, really interesting. But today, Catherine's going to talk to us about rat and pest control. I have spoke to you about this before, Catherine, and it's really, really interesting. So when you're ready, please take it away. Yeah, thank thanks. Um, yeah, I just want to thank um, you, Sam and Ken, for organizing this. It has been really great for all of us, I think, to have these lectures uh, during lockdown. It's been useful academically and uh, as a community, I think. Um, so yeah, today I'll be discussing active pest control in ancient Egypt. And this includes things like uh, traps, as well as uh, divine methods and administration, uh, which separates it from the passive methods which are embedded within the cities. So things like architecture and maybe uh, grain covers. Uh, and the first thing that needs to be covered in this topic is what pests were the problem and why did they need to be dealt with? Uh, and I'll be primarily focusing on pests that affect agriculture directly, uh, as there's the most evidence for this, uh, but also it's where the pests were essentially. Um, and these come in a range of forms. Firstly, the main source of damage comes from insects. Um, However, there are a couple of reasons why they can just wipe out all of in uh, all um, insect species. Firstly, it's really difficult. Um, secondly, as we now know from extensive use of pesticides, um, it wouldn't have been great. Insects are necessary to regulate terrestrial food, train uh, food chains. Um, and it's also extermination was not fully approved of in a religious sense. And that's something that I'll um, discuss a little bit later as well. Um, but unfortunately, generally, studying insects isn't too great and too easy to do. Um, because firstly, iconography isn't clear enough to delineate species, uh, as well as there's a massive lack of pictorial evidence of insects in the first place. Um, but also, uh, Textually, they were generally referred to with the word hafat, which um, doesn't just cover insects like beetles, but also uh, from larvae to slugs and snakes. Of course, there are other terms which are more specific, um, but generally there isn't, uh, there aren't specific terms for each one. Uh, and it's likely that primary pests, so these are insects, generally beetles, that break the husks of grain uh, to actually get into uh, the food supply, uh, allowed the incre uh, increase in secondary pests, which are smaller uh, beetles that can't break these husks. And so you wouldn't find uh, an infestation of secondary pests where you hadn't had primary pests in, pests in the first place. Uh, and these insects were spread from an increase in transportation and trade across the ancient Egyptian empire. And their population was drawn to the artificial microclimates and massive food supplies that are found in uh, grain storage. And once there, they just spread like rabbits. The reduced light and limited space increased ma mating so much, as well as just the food source, which was just basically uh, a perfect storm for breeding infestations. And their continued stay in ancient granaries is evident from their adaptations in their form, which can be seen 
towards the, the late and Greco-Roman periods, they're very clear. Whereas pre-dynastic, when we've got paleoentomological evidence, you can't really tell this too much. Um, so for example, beetles or, or Coleoptera um, have atrophied hind wings, which means um, they're no longer able to fly or fly very well. Um, and this shows that they no longer needed this ability to fly because the food was so consistently abundant in these storage, storage facilities. And dietary adaptations back this up, showing that certain species could no longer even process ripe foods and seeds, but they could only have dried and stored grains. And this clearly shows that the insect infestations in Egypt were a serious problem requiring act active and immediate solutions and intervention. However, it is also important to note that beetles weren't the only insect that destroyed food supplies, architecture, and spread disease. Some species of moth were also primary pests in ancient Egypt, as you can see on the right of the screen. Um, so these include the European grain moth, the Mediterranean flower moth, and the Indian meal moth, all of which were primary pests and are seen in, um, in grain storage dating from the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom onwards. Uh, insects, again, weren't the only pests in ancient Egypt. Rodents were also a persistent and threatening problem to all livelihoods. They weren't solely centred around granaries, however, which insects are more so. They also invaded homes, destroyed walls and architect uh, yeah, architecture, uh, as well as being seen uh, in transportation systems. However, similar issues in analysing rodents also appear to insects. So um, iconog iconographically uh, in pictorial evidence, as well as in textual evidence, they're always very generalised and uh, specific, as well as there's not much evidence in the first place. Uh, so rodents are generally referred to with the word pnu, uh, which is a generalised term. Uh, however, this doesn't indicate specifically a lack of knowledge in ancient Egypt. Um, it is very likely that they did know the difference between species, uh, just because they looked so different, essentially. Um, you may be familiar with this species to the left here. Um, thanks to horrible histories. Um, so that is Ratus ratus. Um, however, it wasn't actually uh, the species that motivated most of the things I'm going to be talking about today, because it was only present in ancient Egypt from the um, Ptolemaic and the Greco-Roman periods. The main culprit that I'll be looking at today, uh, or that motivated the changes that I'll be looking at, um, are the African grass rat and the bandicoot rat, and the latter of which is incredibly aggressive, and is, even today has yet to be successfully domesticated. And it, both of these are a lot smaller than, than ratus ratus, um, yet this doesn't diminish the damage that they can cause and this can be seen through the effects of pests in ancient Egypt. Generally, uh, this is considered the loss of uh, stored food in granaries as well as uh, other home storage. Um, but this loss is not only calculated through grains um, that have been consumed by the pests, but also the infestations, which mean the grains are no longer usable. Uh, which directly leads into the toxicity and the inedibility of agriculture. And it, when insect infestations, so a lot of these insects are uh, minuscule, so not visible to the naked eye unless you're specifically looking for it. Um, when these infestations escalate, the grains can be inedible and completely toxic. And most of the time, uh, infested grains get fed to horses or other pack animals, but it gets to an, a point where these animals, because the grain gets too toxic, 
these animals can get really sick and at some point die, which means entire stores of grain are completely useless. You can't just wash out the grain. You can't just kind of, you know, dry it out in the sun. Um, and pests, particularly primary insects, lead to grain stores having increased levels of mold and other disease. And that's because when they break open the husk, they leave the, the grain susceptible for um, the additional moisture, um, for the, the disease to actually get in and circulate the entire um, plant system. And it, this isn't helped uh, in stores, in the granaries, uh, by damage to the construction, by uh, rodents and other larger animals and pests. And this damage directly explains the need for active, immediate and direct pest control in ancient Egypt. And as I briefly explained earlier, this doesn't include indirect intervention, uh, indirect intervention that took place regularly. Only direct in, uh, intervention with the aim of almost immediate results, uh, including trap, fumigation, administration, and other divine methods. So that there is evidence for traps. However, this is fairly rare. The Middle Kingdom has produced one of the most well-known uh, tra traps in ancient Egypt as you can see um, on the right of the screen. So this is UC16773, found at Lahun. And this was found in fragments, but only um, three pieces. So it wasn't too difficult to put back together. Uh, but many scholars suggest that there are more like it in the archeological record. Yet due to the clay composition, it's often overlooked if it's in a fragmentary state, which, most of the time it would be. Um, and the way it works is fairly interesting, or at least I find it fairly interesting. So on the image, you may be able to see just on this area, um, the three holes, and it, then it would have had this handle starting there, running over to the front of it. And it's got a little bit of a groove in there. And through one of these holes, you would have had a stick. Within the trap, you would have had food on the end of the stick, and then the other end of the stick would have had a little bit of thread, and it would have gone around this little groove over the handle, connected to a door. And then when the rodent went into the trap, it would have uh, gone for the food, tried to pull it, which would have then knocked off the thread and dropped down the door. Um, and this type of trap, uh, is suggested not only just to be for rats, but um, mice as well and other rodents. Uh, although it is likely that this was more predominantly towards the rat side because it's fairly large and these holes, uh, which you can see in the image, would have been large enough for um, some of the mice to actually go in and out of. So not very useful if you want to use it as a mouse trap. Um, but also it's likely to be used as a rat, uh, for a rat um, because Lohun at the time is believed to have been infested with bandicoot rats, uh, which are the very aggressive ones that you saw a couple of slides ago. And it, uh, this belief uh, arises from the damage noted by Petrie and his workers in the late 1800s. Uh, where they note damage to houses with burrows running through the walls and uh, gnawed edges and uh, under floorboards, that kind of thing. Um, unfortunately, there is a rather large lack of evidence, uh, generally apart from this one trap. But despite this, the architectural layout of granaries and other housing would have suited the use of these similar traps. Uh, as animals would have all been filtered in to kind of one narrow area. But it also works with um, robbers and other people, you know, you just filter them through one area. And it's a lot easier to kind of see what is and who is coming in and out. Um, but it's also likely that the Greco-Roman period saw a rise of other types of traps. And that includes uh, the, tra the water traps 
uh, discussed by Marcus Tarantius Varro in his writings on agriculture. And this, uh, the description of this, sees grain laid out in the heat of the sun and kind of dried um, with pails of water and traps or set around the edges. And as the grains begin to dehydrate and dry out in the sun, the animals would be drawn to the water and ultimately drown themselves in the trap. Uh, the thing with this idea is the technique solely works for grain stores with known infestations and it's primarily referenced in Greece and Rome. Yet, with the large cultural interaction during this period, it's possible and likely that this technique also took place in Egypt around this period. One form of pest control that is little researched is fumigation and the use of repellents. The Ebers Papyrus re uh, provides recipes dating to the Middle Kingdom onwards, detailing specific components and illustrating their uses. Uh, the description of incense in the, uh, in the Ebers Papyrus also indicates repellent properties, often including frankincense, myrrh, storax and mastic. And this idea of repellent properties in incense is supported by uh, gas chromatography mass spectroscopy, if I can say it all, all in one go, um, which is a technique that also uh, can support, this, support these compositions whilst further identifying additional compounds such as lotus and sandalwood, which again have repellent properties. Incense for the use of fumigation and repellent purposes were utilized in the form of ash, resins, and typical sensing in incense cups. Uh, for example, ash, um, so incense ash residue uh, can be seen scattered across floors and around walls in Armana. And notably, this is seen specifically at House E, which was a home of a priest, which again um, kind of suggests the religious link there. Uh, these incense compounds have an effect on am animals, particularly incense, uh, insects, sorry, uh, the primary pest of agriculture in Egypt. Uh, for example, one, another thing that GCMS has identified is cinnamon bark, which has transcinamic acid, which kills almost 100% of Citrotroga cereella, or a uh, wheat weevil. Um, and the same species is what uh, Dibs and King have two uh, scientists who focused a lot of their efforts on ancient Egypt and uh, paleoentomology, um, did an experiment where they used frankincense, lotus and sandalwood incense balls, so combined with honey, which is uh, outlined in the Ebers papyrus, um, and that saw a 98% um, mortality rate on the same species. However, there is one drawback with this, and you can't just be like, why weren't the Egyptians using this all the time? Um, the experimentation also demonstrated that damage can be caused to the grains, making them inedible. Um, but many of the insect pests in ancient Egypt were affected to at least some extent by frankincense, storax and mastic, making up uh, consistently the uh, base of incense. There are um, some further theories dating to the late and Greco-Roman period, uh, thanks to Herodotus for that one, uh, about the parody of citronella candles. So um, the oils from berries kind of crushed up, made into an oil, um, and then burnt on a table to keep the flies away. Uh, so that can kind of be head, um, under this heading of fumigation and repellent. Um, but generally, due to the toxicity of the, some compounds and the expense of the materials like mastic and storax and even frankincense that came from quite a while away, uh, it is not likely that this practice took place very often. Something that was constant, however, was the administration of stored products. This may not appear to fit under the heading of active administration, uh, active pest control, sorry. Yet the act actions of administrative staff meant immediate intervention if and when pests were spotted. Scribes, for example, kept watch, noting any loss of grain, 
uh, whilst also spotting larger rodents if they were present. And the keeper of the seal also had a similar role of vigilance, being able to uh, analyze and identify any damage to uh, grain sacks and it know any more specific uh, loss of grain there. Uh, moreover, administration also played a role in passive protection um, because for a large proportion of Egypt's history, they relied on proportional taxation, which would motivate the wealthy to uphold the security and protection of grain stores and supplies. Similarly to administration, divine methods would not typically be considered active pest control. Yet to the ancient Egyptians, this meant immediate intervention to protect grains, property, and all other items, and to rid the area of unwanted animals generally. This, uh, there was an inherent belief in gods and the responsibility they he held, meaning gods like Renan Renanutet, uh, which is the goddess of agriculture, uh, Anubis, Horus, Kepri, Muth, Osiris, Thoth, and a large number of other gods uh, were responsible for the safety of the general food supply. Um, all of the, the named gods I just uh, said there can be seen through textual records of prayers and mantras to protect um, agriculture and food stores. And an example of this is uh, number 848 in the Ebers Papyrus, which lists a prayer to, Osir um, sorry, to Horus for this specific purpose. Uh, Levinson and Levinson uh, in the 1980s also discussed how extermination was seen as malicious and could lead to this divine revenge. Therefore, involvement from the gods was likely the best path forward. Moreover, the line between sensing and fumigation is a thin one, and with incense use an inherently sacred practice, it is possible that. Um, religious roles were kind of involved in the fumigation uh, practices. Um, this is further supported by pictorial evidence, uh, as can be seen in the New Kingdom, where there's an image of a priest spearing a beetle, emphasising the role of religion in active pest control. There we are. In summary, insects were the biggest threat to agriculture, and therefore ancient Egyptian life in general. They not only consumed grain and infested it, making it inedible to, uh, to even animals, but primary insects broke the husks of grain, making them more susceptible to mold, whilst also spreading a, a disease across the empire. The Egyptians did not let this go unnoticed, battling their presence with water traps and repellents, as well as attempting to call upon the gods for divine intervention. Rodents also caused a, uh, a large amount of damage to agriculture and architecture. Uh, close observation through the administra uh, administration system was used, along with possibly a widespread use of traps, although this isn't very well attested to. In either case, uh, the role of religion was present and is uh, seen within divine methods directly, as well as through other levels of sacrality, such as priests taking part in pest control and the use of divine incense. The use of active pest control clearly developed in the ancient world, influencing, influenced by neighbouring states and cultures continually changing to face the most predominant and damaging pests at the time. This has led to a complex yet unfortunately not too present data set in the archaeological, pictorial and textual records, leaving a fairly wide area open for further study. And over the next couple of pages, I've just got a bit of selected bibliography, but um, yeah, I'd be happy to take any of your uh, questions there. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was absolutely brilliant. Although I am feeling a little bit itchy with all this talk about bugs and things, <laughs> especially in my hair. There's been too much talk of hair and bugs. It's not a good thing. Yeah, I should have, should have done a disclaimer at the start. <laughs> we will be talking about rats and insects. <laughs> I'm okay with the rats. It's the bugs that make me... <laughs> So I've got a question from Bob for you, obviously something that would be difficult to spot in the archaeological record, but surely best rodent control is going to be cats. 
Yep. So um, village cats was a, a consistent thing, and I definitely uh, could have included that in pet, uh, like active pest control. Um, but as far as we can tell, that was uh, definitely something that took place um, even in the old kingdom and was uh, quite consistent. Oh, Bob's got his cat ready, just in case one. <laughs> I saw a few cats make an appearance, just as that was mentioned. All this talk of rats, you see, they're ready to go. A uh, question from Louise, is there any evidence of pet rats? Um, so again, that is a possibility. And it's, some people uh, looked at the supposed rat trap and suggested that that could be uh, for pets. That's why it had the holes for like air holes and you wouldn't have air holes for a trap. Um, but with, especially in Lahun, it, if it was the bandicoot rat, uh, they are so incredibly aggressive that uh, I would be very surprised if they did keep uh, that particular species as a pet. Um, and it, uh, there are kind of uh, four childhood nicknames, I know in the New Kingdom, they do have um, the names of kind of like rat as like a pet nickname. Um, so it's it's possible. Um, it's just not something that's incredibly well attested for. Oh, cool, thank you. And I'm gonna regret asking this, but I take it these traps are not humane traps. Is there any evidence of how said rodents would be dispatched? Um, again, this is uh, because it's one of the ones that is, there's only one example. So people are like, oh, well, it could be air holes. Uh, but it, it's more likely that they're um, just viewing holes that you're able to see that you've caught something instead of just like opening up and then have a rat jump on your face. <laughs> um, and it, so I don't know specifically how they would have been killed. I know that we actually don't have uh, much evidence. Um, like there are a couple of recipes in medicinal guides that um, call for uh, parts of rats' bodies uh, in medicines, but as far as we can tell, they weren't used as a food supply, like in other places. Um, so I, I doubt they were kind of like dispatched and butchered for, for food purposes, um, but, but apart from they were likely killed, I, I can't give you much more information, I'm afraid. <laughs> No well, problem. the rat trap's got holes in the side, so you just dump it in water. Oh, yeah, that could rat. also work, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Poor little thing. Hence ratatouille. Oh, <laughs> Arthur. Sorry. <laughs> See, I'm just thinking of flushed away now. Yes. <laughs> I have a question from Pat about hordes of locusts. Are there any texts or evidence referring to locust infestation? Um... That is not something I've particularly looked at. I looked at more um, the agricultural side, um, but uh, locust infestations um, were and definitely are um, certainly a thing. I, I just haven't analysed those specifically, I'm afraid. And I noted you put in a picture of one of the granary fumary models. So extra points for you for including fumary <laughs> figures. <laughs> um, Kristen's also pointed out on his excavations that they also find a lot of, of rodent feces. And I seem to remember one of the granary models had some real grain in it that had been taken away by, by rats. Is there much evidence in tomb context of worrying about rat infestation or, or insect? Um. <laughs> Or is it a domestic thing? Uh, there are definitely examples in um, tomb context. One of the issues that we have is uh, an issue of dating uh, because for um, tombs often, uh, the, the coprolites, you've got a lot of um, leeway of when uh, rat feces become uh, coprolites and when uh it's very difficult to date um like rat skeletons to say like 3000 bc uh but there are a couple of very interesting ones which also i should have mentioned earlier about the rats as pets um 
it's mice uh, that we see. Um, there's a really interesting example dating into the late period of a, a mummified uh, mouse, which wasn't um, for cat food at all. It was actually within the uh, sarcophagus itself. Um, and there is a theory that that was uh, a healing practice um, because it was over a broken bone that was uh, healing at the time. Uh, but it could also have been kind of uh, possibly a, a, a pet itself. Um, however, because this is a, a fairly, not new, but not very well uh, researched area, not many people kind of uh, look at uh, rodents and that kind of thing. Everything is more uh, a prelim preliminary study. A lot of people just say, this is my theory. I don't know what about it. Um, and so that's what I've definitely been finding when I go through scholarship. Everybody kind of just puts out their thoughts and you have to make what you, uh, you think of it. I'll ask you one more now, Captain, and then we'll let you catch your breath and give Molly some, but there may be some more questions for you as well, I'm afraid. Uh, is there any evidence of the ancient Egyptians using pests as amulets, which we kind of spoke about already? Could that be to neutralise their negative traits, so the violent animals turn protective, or even amulets for their positive traits, like the tenacity of the rats and the golden flies of valour comes to mind? Is there an equivalent for rodents? I wouldn't mind a rat of valour. <laughs> Um, that is a really interesting question. Um, apart from the mouse, I can't think of any physical um, examples because that that was just um, a one-off, and that was uh, that was the paper that why that was why it was all theoretical at that point. Um, but you've definitely got the the fly amulet. Um, I can't think of any. Uh, amulets of any forms of rodentia off the top of my head uh, but if you guys can I would more than happily take advice off you. <laughs> Following on from that there is that somebody asked if you could pop your email address in the chat if you don't mind if people would like to get in touch and yeah of course further about things yeah. so we'll let you have a breather if Molly doesn't mind taking some more questions. Nope fire away. Fantastic um, so we had a bit of discussion in the chat about the, the melting cones on the top of the head. Um, oh, no. Is there any evidence for these within the wig context or do they seem to have been worn on natural hair? Um, yes, actually, I did come across um, a few um, cones and a discussion of wearing cones on top of wigs and um, uh, What's where uh, perfuming wigs as well. I did see a little bit, but I didn't go too far into that realm, but I did see it. <laughs> uh, there's several questions about where did the hair come from? Is this something that was donated willingly? I know it's yes. really hard that to find was, evidence of. <laughs> that was actually one of my um, main area of interest as well, because um, having all of them be um, of human hair really opens a whole market or like weird thing about human hair. And I, I'm not sure if it was traded. Is there like a market for trading hair? I don't know. Was, I could not find anything about that. And I was really like looking forward <laughs> to covering that as well. And there's just roughly no evidence about that. But they, it has to come from somewhere, and I'm just not sure if it was willing participants or if there were you could trade it like um, normal goods, like here's my hair, give me some food, you know, type thing. Um, it's just uh, one of those things. <laughs> uh, and then I have a question about the braids. Uh, Eileen understands that sometimes braids were attached to human hair. Do we know how this may have been done and how they would have been detached when they were no longer needed? Um, yes, the only um, examples of like extensions or like uh, braids being attached in the hair, um, they were knotted and there is um, like a similar, that is kind of similar to how you would do it today, but um, I believe it's just at the like very root of your hair, you would just tie that section on and it like knotted itself so it would hold um, and I'm assuming um, like 
modern examples, they would fall out over time, but I'm not quite sure. Um, we don't have a lot of evidence for that, but um, most likely knotted to the hair. And whilst you're demonstrating on your hair, the next Oh, question. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've got has it. Any, has any experimental archaeology been done on making wigs? Or do we um, need to organize yeah. something at the Egypt Center? <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, actually, um, Stephen Cox uh, did a lovely um, uh, paper about um, one of the wigs uh, from the British Museum, and it was one of the uh, duplex wigs, the one with like the almost blonde hair on top and then brown hair on the bottom. He um, fully made a wig using the same techniques from scratch. And he has pictures of himself doing that. And that was super interesting. And I believe um, Joanne Fletcher also has done some wig reconstruction. But yes, there have been some trials. Oh, I was hoping we were going to have a party in the Egypt Center and make some. Oh, I know. Well, we could totally do that. That would totally, that would, that's totally doable. Excellent. We've all a plan for when lockdown's over. Yes. <laughs> I think that's all the questions for both Catherine and Molly I've had in the chat. I will ask if anybody wants to turn on their mics and ask anything else. I've got, I've got right. one to come through to Marie, okay. uh, from Marie uh, for Kath. Uh, due to the, uh, the large grain stores belonging to temples, would the role of religion and priests be more inherent? Or can you distinguish between differences in state pest control methods and those of temples? That is something I am definitely trying to look at. Um, I am actually leaning towards uh, daily life um, and general state um, pest control actually being a part of religious pest control. So whether like priests had to come out to grain storage uh, regularly and they'd kind of fumigate if they chose those kind of methods. Um, whereas things like uh, the traps wouldn't have had to be monitored and wouldn't have had to have those roles um but that's why i think it's very interesting in armana where you've got the homes of the priests which um again had the the grain storage attached to them but even the homes had uh the repellents kind of um around them too and um, and that's kind of an interesting link that i'm definitely looking into um whether the role of religion is completely inherent in all forms of pest control. Um, so yeah, it's it's something that I'm working towards answer, answering. Any other questions for either of our lovely panelists? I think you're free, ladies. So just to say thank you so, so much. There's so many comments saying how much people have enjoyed these two very different talks. And um, we've both shared your emails. So if anyone wants to ask any further questions of Molly or Catherine, do get in touch with them. And I've really enjoyed this opportunity to see some of the research from our Swansea University students and EC volunteers as well. So it's, this is something we do try to work into our program for the Friends every year is is giving our students the opportunity to present their research. It's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so, so much, guys. You've been amazing. We'll send you a copy of the chat each so you can have a look at all the lovely comments in there for you. And without further ado, I'll just let you know the date of the next talk, which should be written on my wall. It's the 16th of June. It will be by Steve Harvey, and we should have a title for you guys soon. You'll all also receive a recording of today's lectures as well, so you can watch them back if you want to double check anything. So once again, thank you so, so much to both Molly and Catherine, and we'll see you all at the next one. Thank you, guys. As, you as Sam you. says as well, this is, this is something we've been doing with the Friends of the Egypt Centre for a while, where we offer the uh, students the opportunity to present usually in May when we do that. So it would be nice to have people's feedback, whether you think we should, this is something that we should continue to do in terms of presenting a forum for the students. Uh, I think it's worked really well and I see a lot of <laughs> thumbs up and nodding heads. So that's really great to see. Um, I'm not sure whether Molly and Kath saw, thought that they were gonna have um, almost a hundred people in attendance today. And I think for both of you, this is your first ever public presentation. Yeah. So virtual round of applause for them, I think. So well, well done, both. <laughs> <laughs>
Ken, did you want to do a quick plug for your Oman, of course, while we have people here? Yeah, I could do. So if anyone, is, in fact, I could even share the slide if uh, if anyone is interested in that. My uh, next short course is starting this Sunday. I'll just put up the slide now, which is on the Amarna period. And I know that you either love it or you hate it. And there are many people here on the course that actually hit the uh, the Amarna period, which is uh, which is fine. Let me go back to the slide. Where is it? Uh, and many of you have probably done multiple courses on the Amarna period and probably thinking, well, it's been done to death. This one will be a little bit different in that during the five sessions, around about 30 minutes or so of, of each session will be devoted to the Egypt Center objects that we have from Amarna of which we have around about 300 or so, including this fragment of painted plaster, which you can see uh, from the palace that we have there. We've also got four beautiful uh, broad collars, which some of you will have seen before, uh, as well as lots of other faience, uh, stone and other objects there. So if you're interested, you can book tickets for that via our Eventbrite page, which Sam will post in the link. If you have already, book tickets for that. You should have received an email from me, which I sent out on Monday. If you haven't received that email, do please send me an email ASAP so that I can send you the link and find out why you never received it. So hopefully you can join us for that. Uh, as always, Sam will be joining us and moderating uh, the sessions for that. So it's really great that we can have the two of us there uh, again doing that. So thanks to everyone who has booked and really for supporting the Egypt Centre over the past uh, what, 13 months or so now. And we'll try and do another quiz after that one as well, I think. People seem to enjoy the last one. <laughs> so, and the, the final thing I need to say to you all is thank you so much. We did have several donations, even though this was a free talk today. So thank you so much to everybody who made a donation today for the Egypt Centre as well. It really makes a difference at the moment as we're still closed to the public. Well, fingers crossed, not too long now until we start getting you all back into visiting real life. So hopefully we'll see you all on the 16th of June. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Bye.